well, you've interviewed a lot of very notable people. Um, I want to touch on your most memorable interview. When I was reading through the list of people you've interviewed, I was like, wow, I, you probably have more than one memorable one. But yeah. So I'll mention more than one mm -hmm. memorable one because each interviewee is a different person. Yeah. They come with a different mindset experience and you'll you know, you'll learn one or two things from a person just by virtue of them being culturally mm -hmm. um, different to you. My first big interview as a journalist was with the late Benazia Bhutto. Mm. She was the first female prime minister of a Muslim country. She was the prime minister of Pakistan, elected. She was strong. She was incredibly beautiful to look at mm. and really sharp intellectually. So interviewing her felt like a sparring match because she was just moving three four steps ahead of you all the time you've got your 10 prepared questions and she's already and she's, on, like, she's already there. answered question seven and then you're like what? whilst you whilst you just <laughs> asked question number two right you know so she was really a marvel mm -hmm. to be around because she, she was she really epitomized confident feminine feminist leadership yeah. and yet at the same time she was so graceful she was so proud of her heritage mm -hmm. she was so proud of the country from which she came but she was so determined to fight for the rights that she stood for um so that was quite inspiring did, the, did it then having such a, a strong experience with her did it how did you feel when she passed i was really heartbroken and i remember i was watching it on television whilst um, on holiday in South America. So, I mean, you know, you couldn't have more incongruent right. circumstances. But I felt like I, felt like I knew her, mm -hmm. even though I'd only spent an hour of my life yeah. with her. And to the very end, you know, she was going to stand up with conviction for what she believed in, looking as graceful and as strong-willed as she was. Yeah. And I think she lived her life true to herself mm -hmm. and I think that's something I would learn from Benazir Bhutto and I, I don't want to get bogged down in the politics yeah. of Pakistan a country I barely know politics I barely understand mm -hmm. so the merits demerits it's not for me to say but what I can say with sheer confidence is I think to the end she was willing to fight for what she believed mm -hmm. and I think there's something there's a lesson for all of us there in conviction and standing for something and making your life be about something, you know, really impacting the humanity around you. Another interviewee that I, I really enjoyed was uh, Paul Kagame. Mm -hmm. Now, this is fairly controversial because at the moment, everybody's looking at Rwanda and is really quite critical of the security situation, yeah. of the confluence between Rwanda and the conflict in the DRC, those kinds of issues. But I think there is a leader who also came into a position mm -hmm. under very trying circumstances on the back of one of the most horrific historical incidents in our lifetime, a genocide. He was tasked with not just rebuilding a country after war, mm -hmm. but trying to unite a people who'd been divided because of this war, and then creating a general sense of security for, for a people who felt vulnerable. It's not an easy task, and he's also just steely in his yeah. resolve. I might not agree with his politics, but when you see six-year-olds in school using laptop computers, technology being introduced across the spectrum of government business, home affairs, uh, immigration, mm -hmm. uh, the traffic department, and you see people at work, then you see you know, what can be accomplished when you put your mind to it yeah. and you take the politics out of it. And so I found him quite intriguing. And I've always loved Grasa Michelle. I've had the privilege of interviewing her more than one time. You know, she is once, twice, three times a lady. And at the same time, don't mess with her. When it comes to issues of women and children, mm -hmm. her argumentation is deep, it's intense, it's forthright, it's fiery. And yet again, Still that still grace. Lady. Yeah. Well, well, you've met some extraordinary people, and I'm sure you have stories to tell for days, <laughs> once-in-a-lifetime experiences. Do you ever think about putting them all down and, and 
compiling them into a book Jennifer with you. Seventy-year-old <laughs> journalist. I've told up my whole life. It's so many I stories. Of me and I, I think, think when I can no longer broadcast and I no yeah. longer have the stamina to travel, then maybe I would consider memoirs. Just. Mm -hmm my experience of world leaders yeah. but also more importantly my experience of ordinary people because what the BBC has done is say to me you've got to move from a position where the viewpoint of power is the only valid viewpoint right. ordinary people have a voice they have a say and it's relevant and mm -hmm. the kind of journalism we do at the BBC is it's it's across the spectrum you've got to get the newsmaker mm -hmm or the power broker to defend or articulate their position. But not before you've spoken to the ordinary person who's impacted by that position. And in fact, you become the bridge between the everyman and the political elite. Mm -hmm. And what people cannot ask their politicians verbally, it's incumbent on you to bring it to them purely by quoting them, purely by saying, right. I've just been on the streets of Cape Town. And this is how people feel about sanitation, this is how they feel about housing, this is how they feel about electricity, this is how they feel about rates and taxes. Mm -hmm. Because I'm in a position to speak to the mayor, the premier, the president, right. in a way in which the flower seller cannot do. And so the BBC's take on journalism is bringing every relevant view to the fore. Mm -hmm.